Uh, so welcome everyone one to our webinar uh, on Where's the Money? This is a part of a series of, of webinars that we run from the Canberra Innovation Network, where we're just you're putting out content, we're bringing in great experts, and you'll hear from them in a minute, uh, and hopefully creating a really interactive discussion with lots of entrepreneurs um, to, to inform you. Now, of course, uh, Where's the Money is, uh, it almost feels a bit 2020 to be doing it in webinar format because actually we've been doing most of our things from the Canberra Innovation Network in person, in small groups and one-on-one. And -on -one. We've, we've been able to do that within the COVID restrictions. So it's really exciting, you know, it's sort of, it, it, but we have, have the whole mix, got to have the whole mix and we're reaching you all with this hopefully nice, sharp, efficient one hour of really interesting practical information. Uh, before I go further, I sort of said we're broadcasting from the Canberra Innovation Network. Of course, that that is from Ngunnawal land and we, you know, we want to acknowledge always the uh, elders past, present emerging from the Ngunnawal people and thank them for allowing us to use their land to do all these great activities. Um, so, yeah, I think without more introduction, I'm just going to sort of start off uh, where's the money? Uh, we'll be, I'll be introducing in a minute uh, our guests, but I'll, I'm going to skip over quickly. But we've got Roseanne, Andy, Ken, uh, really interesting experts. Uh, Irene and I will be hosting. Irene will be really engaging with you through the chat channel mostly. Um, ask, ask questions on the chat. Ask questions on the chat. I want everyone to type questions on the chat. We'll try and get you backwards and forwards. Uh, at a certain time, we might get you to unmute yourself and speak to everyone as well. Um, please do that. Um, my name's Craig Davis. Uh, I run the growth programs here at the Canberra Innovation Network. I started life as a scientist. I became an entrepreneur. And these days, I'm just really, really excited to be uh, engaging with, empowering and connecting the next generations of entrepreneurs who are creating amazing new innovative businesses, um, make the world a better place, make people, help people to get great benefits and a love going on to people. Uh, so that's sort of our broad purpose. I've sort of already said this, the point is to share experience, to get some tips, um, learn some useful information and really allow you to ask your questions of, of three really interesting experts on our four, on our uh, subject today, which is money. Money is a subject which is close to the heart of every business person, every entrepreneur, um, as it should be. So we'll come to that in a minute. Um, what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm just gonna introduce a couple of thoughts from me about money, and then we'll go, and then we'll hear from our panel. Um, now, before I talk about money, I like to talk about value. Um, value, that is, I, it's, it's, we should be thinking about the value we create and that leads to money. Money, money is our proxy for value in, in our economy. Um, you know, if somebody pays $3.50 for a small cup of coffee, that means that they think that coffee is worth $3.50. So, um, the, you know, somebody won't just give you $3.50 but they will if you give them a coffee that they value, if they enjoy, if they've, you know, they say, wow, this is a nice coffee and, and really tasty and, and, and I enjoyed it. Does that, does that make sense? So I want you to think about value for your um, stakeholders and particularly we love starting everything with customers. So do think about what's, what's the thing that you can do for your customer that they can't even live without. Right, and that's when you when you're able to say that when you know that customers can't live without something, then you've got some value, right? And I just want to just remind you about value. We won't dwell on that, um, but it's really important to at every stage when you're uh, trying to get more impact from your ideas to search for value. I'm just going to really quickly list and talk about very generally some sources of money, and just to broaden out the conversation. And the first thing is. The first source of money we always talk about is money from customers, right? Customers, customer money is the best money. If somebody's paying for something that you want, now maybe your product's not ready, you should be thinking about pre-sales, about deposits, um, about a paid pilot program, that sort of stuff. So always think about uh, customers. 
Uh, if you're more established when you talk about customers, sometimes you can talk about payment terms. Maybe your customer will pay part up front, they'll pay a deposit, they'll pay progress payments. That really can help you with your cash flow. So don't forget about customers and managing cash in what some might consider a traditional business methodology, um, but it's a thing, right? It's, 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 it's relevant to all businesses. Um, I'm gonna briefly uh, mention another one, reducing costs. So one way of effectively getting money to do things with is by spending less on, on other things. Um, it's not very cool to th talk about saving money. It's not very exciting, but there's a time and place where a dollar saved is, a, is better than a dollar earned. A dollar saved can be much better than a dollar earned. If you're, if you're spending money you don't need to, and you can transfer that into really the things that create value, then we're excited. Um, any and all of these we'll we can delve into more with the panel. Um, grants, of course, uh, governments and sometimes corporations will hand out grants. Grants, they'll give you a grant to, to give you money to do a certain purpose. Uh, we've got uh, Accelerating Commercialization represented here. We'll hear from Andy about that. Um, grants can be a fabulous thing. They have this great attribute, which is they typically don't ask for too much in return. They just want you to do the work you promised. Um, there, there, there can be a cost with grants, which is the time to do it, which, that can be relevant. Um, my second comment about grants is, you're gonna hear about a couple or a few things that are happening and very accessible, but also think outside the box. There are often obscure grants that might be very, um, might be very specific to your industry. Please engage with them, look for them. They won't come knocking on your door necessarily. You've got to go look. So think outside the box. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk a bit later about the research and development tax uh, offset tax incentive, where there's really opportunities to get money back, uh, cash money back for small businesses um, that you spent on genuine research and development. Um, don't forget debt, borrowing money. Now, sometimes the bank doesn't want to give you money or only wants to give you money if you borrow against your, you know, your home mortgage or something like that. Yeah, be careful. Um, but there are actually other lenders around and we'll certainly hear from Ken about a couple of, about his option there, but other, there are, you know, debt. Don't forget debt because in a startup or innovation world, we often start the conversation with the one that I mentioned, that I'm mentioning last, which is equity investment. That is where somebody gives you money in return for some share in the company or some upside in the future. Um, angel investors, venture capital investors, I've just listed family office um, because that's a that's a an, an asset class that not everyone really knows about, and there's many many other um, equity investors around there. So these are I've just given you a super quick um, uh, run through of investment sources. Uh, Irene, is there? I'm seeing the chat pretty active. Is there anything there that I should be responding to? Um, there's been a couple of comments on you know saving money. Uh, I think from Serena. Oh, Serena's uh, great on saving money. Yes. <laughs> Talk to Serena. Follow her podcast, The Joyful, Joyful Frugalista. Uh, Serena, please uh, put that on the chat if you didn't already. Uh, Claire's got a question on if any there are any bank people here. Is there a general policy of blacklisting anyone who's been on JobKeeper? Not really sure about the specifics of that. Not, not that, that I'm be. aware of. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Anyone from my expert panel want to jump in on that? But I'm, I'm not aware of any particular problem there. Um, when you go to a lender, you need to make a case typically that you're credit worthy and that you're likely to pay it back. Um, and, you, you know, they'll take into account a lot of factors, but I don't think that I'm aware of any particular blacklists of that sort. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, really introduce our expert panel um, and uh, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, if that's okay, uh, and then we'll start up a, a, a more Q&A type conversation. So let's start off with Roseanne Brand, 
uh, a senior advisor. I hope I, I'm not sure your exact job title. Sorry, Roseanne at PwC. Um, we've worked with Roseanne on a number of projects and she's part of the Canberra Innovation Network Advisory Board, which has been a pleasure to work with her. Uh, Roseanne, quickly tell us about yourself. Thanks, Craig. Uh, it's just wonderful to be here today. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I am a partner at PwC and the role that I have is advising organisations how to transform, but in particular using digital innovation to do that transformation. Uh, one of the things I'm so deeply passionate about is the role innovation has in driving our economy forward. And so if it wasn't for people like you on this call, our economy would stifle and we absolutely don't want to do that. So the more of this that we can get, uh, I think the better for everyone in this amazing country of ours. I, I really do feel privileged and, and really fortunate to be a part of the Canberra Innovation Advisory Council and, and, and the, the community there. And it's just wonderful working with you, Greg. So looking forward to the session today. Um, and Roseanne, if there was one source of money that you really want to put on the table or think that people need to engage with or talk about, what would it be? So there are um, two really interesting grant funds that Defence mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. um, Defence, as you know, are, are all about trying to find ideas to drive their future strategy for mm -hmm. the defence of this nation. It's not just about um, bombs and planes and ships. It's about all sorts from, from medical interventions through to um, cyber and, and so forth. So um, they have a couple that we'll be sharing in the chat through Irene, but I really encourage yep. people to have a look at the Defence Innovation okay. Fund. Uh, thanks for mentioning that, Roseanne, and, and Irene's already put a couple of links in the chat. I think that's really much on that theme I said. Grants are out there and they're not always the obvious ones and sometimes they're sector specific. And I just want to add one more comment or, in fact, ask you, yeah. Roseanne. My perception is that a lot of those defence grants are actually uh, really uh, can, can help companies that are outside what you might call traditional defence. Uh, you might not be making a gun or a bomb and it still could be highly, they do personnel stuff, they do, they need innovation in, in footwear, they need innovation in, in, in all sorts of areas that, that, you know, so I want you to think creatively, you know, does that make sense? Uh, look, that's absolutely spot on. I, I know a friend of mine who's got a, a great little um, business where she's designing fashion for women in defence so that they can feel comfortable running a course or doing exercises in <laughs> clothes that actually fit them. I mean, this, this is the kind Fantastic. of innovation that you can take to defence. Hey, can I meet that person? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a business I'd like to know more about. I mean, you know, and we, you know, and that's, I think that's a fantastic example that should be inspiring people to think, you know, uh, I, my, I thought I was in apparel, not defence, but actually they really can match together. Thank you so much, Roseanne. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll keep you in the conversation, but next I'm going to introduce uh, Ken Kroger, uh, uh, who's, well, I don't, I, I'm going to let you tell your story, Ken. Ken, tell us about yourself. Um, well, at a high level, I guess I've, I've had the pleasure and um, privilege of leading, I guess, three companies over the last 25-ish uh, years and seeing those businesses grow and, and uh, two of them selling and the third one being a public listed company, seeing it grow significantly. And uh, it's been a journey of discovery. And, um, you know, I'm not sure I call it a pleasure, but I've had the the requirement to raise probably over about uh, close to $200 million over that time uh, for the various companies from uh, begging, borrowing and almost stealing. So I'm happy to share the secrets with you. With the highest possible uh, integrity standards, I know, Ken. Uh, and you know, Craig, you asked a question about the uh, the types of money, and for me, the um, yep. the money that you want to look for is the right type of money, and the one that you know the money. You know, Craig talked about value. Um, I think I think about alignment and the uh, expectations, and you know whoever you're asking that money for to make sure ultimately that your their expectations are aligned with yours. Otherwise, it's a ends up being a bit of a sad story and a lot harder than you want it to be. Uh, well, look, so we should probably delve into that a bit more about expectations of your funders um, and, and, and getting things together. Ken, you're also, one of your activities at the moment is an organisation called Epicorp. Quickly tell us what you do there. Yeah, it's, a, I think, a great initiative, quite unique. I somehow, you know, through uh, some ex-government funding, I inherited um, a, uh, a small company and uh, it's uh, 
owned by ANU, University of Canberra, and uh, CSIRO. And the proceeds that remain in that business are available to be lent out in a not-for-profit fashion. And in our case, the only expectation is that we get paid back over 24 months. So it's um, you're probably some of the easiest money uh, you'll ever find if you meet a few conditions. Yeah, fantastic. Epicorp's actually part of the long history of supporting innovation in Canberra. And that was effectively an incubator before anyone invented the word incubator. Um, back in the, I think, late 90s, early 2000s, they incubated some really cool companies, invested in some companies and, and generated some returns that Ken and his colleagues are now able to re, re, uh, reinvest, re-engage into the innovation community through these uh, venture debt loans. And we'll talk about them a little bit more in a minute. Uh, so that's fantastic. Now, Andy, did you, were you able to connect? Because Andy yes, had some... Yeah. Aha, uh-huh. Andy, introduce yourself, mate. Thanks, Craig. Uh, enjoyed your overview at the start. I was uh, taking some notes there myself. <laughs> um, so I currently work with Accelerating Commercialization, which is a grants program offering $1 million uh, to companies who are taking new technology to the market. So I have a role there uh, coaching the startups that we're working with, part of a team of 25 people across the country doing that. Um, prior to that, I was working at CSIRO running one of their startup programs, um, part of a team there that over uh, four years launched 60 startups that now have a market valuation of about 400 million. So that was that was good fun. And before that, I had my own company doing um, augmented reality for science education. So good to be here. Augmented reality for science communication, fantastic. So accelerating commercialization is part of the federal government. Um, uh, department that that supporting entrepreneurship uh, and and these are uh, very substantial grants accelerating commercialization up to one million dollars matched funding so you need to find a matching source of funding uh, and some of the other grants and other sources of money you need to sort of combine a couple together right and I didn't talk about that earlier but sometimes when you're building when you're finding the money for your project you know, you might combine together a few different sources. Does anyone on the panel want to comment on that? Ken, you must have put together lots of different sources for seeing. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess for you know, for most people, it starts with your own money, um, and then it goes to uh, what is it? You know, the friends, fools, and family, and then ultimately, you want to go to somebody a little bit more sophisticated. And you know, Craig mentioned private offices, family offices, angel investors. And then from there, you know, the ultimate, you know, the logical sequences and venture capital and from venture capital into the next round of, you know, potentially borrowing and or listing. So there's a, a hierarchy and each one of those comes with very, very different expectations, different amounts of effort, different sizes, you know, sweet spots, different types of investors. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about finding, you know, smart money that can bring more than just the, you know, the, you want the money to bring you value as well as just the capital but also patient money that understands the, uh, the hardships you're going to encounter along the road. It's always going to take longer, be more expensive and harder than you expect. So you want to make sure that, that whoever's putting that money into your bank account is yeah, part I of that can, journey with you. I can see Roseanne sort of smiling ruefully on some of those lessons learned. Do you want to comment on that? I, I, Ken, I, I love what you're saying there. And, and just kind of to add to it, I think looking for uh, money in that, in that smart money way Smart money is not just the advice you can get with it, but it could also be your starting customer. So thinking about where you might be able to, say, seek out an organisation, say, well, I've got this great idea. Um, can you co-invest in, in this? You know, I'll give you first starter um, opportunities, but it, let's, let's co-develop. A, um, a product that's, that's going to give you value, that's aligned to your strategy, that might be about um, you know, bringing either value to your customers or reducing your costs. And so trying to find not just the smart money, but, but also a way to give your business a launch pad. Fantastic. And, and um, yeah, I think I just yeah, touched yeah. on that. You're like, often you want. And um, you know, working with a first time investor. Uh, can be really fraught with risk as well. You know, you want somebody that's either done what you're doing before, or a little bit more sophisticated. You know, the deal is the conditions of the deal, the terms of the deal, the expectations behind the deal, written and unwritten, uh, along with the person's experience and expectations, are all critical. 
couple of questions I'm already seeing on the chat and I'm just going to start feeding them in if that's okay. And the first one I just sort of want to mention, uh, Claire has said, please, please also refer to some examples that are not completely technology. And we really try to define uh, innovation very broadly. Uh, and and, and I, I thought uh, Roseanne's mentioned people in defence is probably heading in that direction. Uh, we do lots of work in the social services or the social um, uh, the business process innovation and that sort of stuff. So there's, um, but we'll sort of bear that in mind, Claire, and hopefully bring you out some examples that can make you feel like what we're talking about or parts of what we're talking about can connect with you and your needs. Uh, Jamie's also asked, um, there's a lot written about venture capital that's very US centric and a lot of the media comes from America or you, write, you hear about the Silicon Valley thing and all of that sort of thing. And he's quite correctly said, uh, it's not necessarily the same here in Australia, right? Uh, and he's uh, asked for resources that he can look at. And I would say, uh, my little comment is, uh, it's not like I've got a really good handbook and you go, go look at this one for the Australian version, but there are, there connect to people in the system. Um, uh, you'll find different variations uh, about the Australian system, in some ways it's better than the American system. I think we're often able to cope with um, a, a wider variety of, of innovations that aren't just your standard, you know, the next Facebook and all of that sort of thing. Uh, of course, there's less money in Australia. And sometimes, and I'm probably going to turn it around in some ways, don't forget that, some, that money can come from outside Australia into an, in, an Australian innovation. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I'm thinking of a really successful company, uh, Canberra-based company, uh, that, that's raised money from probably all of the sources we've mentioned, uh, including uh, at a later stage, some American investors. Ken, I know you've got international investors in, and there's a time and a place for that. Um, it's, yeah, the, I think it, you know, it's, it's, it's two different worlds. They both have their pros and cons. You know, valuations are very different. Levels of experience are very different. Expectations are different. Roseanne, do you want to add anything to that? Look, what I would add is that it's so important to get your structures right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And this is your governance as well as your company structures. And making sure you're getting the right kind of advice as you are putting in place those structures. And then, then when you think about it, right, it, it's then up to finding the right match for you in the people that you're working with people who uh, connect with your vision, your passion, uh, who can help you with, uh, whether it's the numbers or, or the networks. Um, we, we talked earlier about finding um, the right uh, pathways to investment. Never underestimate the networks that these people will be able to help you with uh, in connecting and, and then to a, to a step, you, you do need to do your own due diligence, but then you're also getting the added benefit of the, the network that you trust uh, being extended. So it's, it's, you know, thinking very closely about the people that are involved, the structures that you have and making sure you're getting that, that good advice early on for both the company structure and the governance. I think I just uh, adding to that, you know, sort of between what um, Roseanne's saying and Craig is saying about, you know, the looking to customers sometimes instead of a customer it can be on your supply chain side as well. So upstream, um, you know, where you doing something really well leads them to selling more of something or they might be a manufacturer. You know, so somewhere on the upstream yeah. side of your business, you might find somebody that's really interested in helping you grow your business as well. And sometimes I just I was just talking to a company yesterday, and there's their key supplier of a machine that they're going to use to build their product. Uh, that supplier is giving them favourable payment terms um, to to make it easier for them to pay. Yeah. Does that make sense? So the the, the supplier is providing some of the finance just simply by effectively delaying their invoice. Uh, it's super powerful. It really helps with the funding mix. And that supplier has done it. Why? Because they see the potential to get to get more business out of this down the track. Everybody's a great, a great example. Uh, somebody I know quite well. They own a, a fairly large, I think it's thirty six optical store, you know, opt optical stores in, across London, Western US, and into Canada now. And um, you know, instead of raising money, they set up. They they've gone sole source supply from a certain lens manufacturer, and that lens manufacturer gave them, I think, about two million US credit. 
and uh, you know that they can either use the credit to for lend stock or draw down money for other purposes as well. Fantastic. Um, Claire's just mentioned social enterprise and not for profit entities. Um, they need money too. They're doing amazing, important purposes. Um, the way I frame that is if you're creating value with your purpose, you should be you're finding ways to, to align that with somebody who can fund you. Now, some of the venture capital we, we talked about doesn't always work, but, but don't always forget it. But grants, um, all of these things, you should be well placed to engage yeah. with. I think um, in that case also, you know, there's foundations, you know, both yes. here in the ACT, the Snow Foundation, or more broad, the Meyer Foundation. You know, there's other more specific ones. You know, whether if it's medical, it might be one of the associations, you know, diabetes or heart foundation, uh, both domestically and internationally. You know, if, depending on the, your cause. Yeah. yeah, and I would just add to that, Ken, it, it, that people are motivated to invest for different reasons. And so if your story is, is crisp about the value that you're going to bring, be it a you know, social enterprise or uh, something around the, the um, circular economy, it, it, there are going to be people who connect with your story and will want to uh, bring momentum to your business because they they really do connect with with what it is you're trying to achieve so yeah, finding uh, the right investors there absolutely and there's um you know uh, we sort of talked briefly about the difference between you know your classic silicon valley investor i'm only interested if i'm going to earn a billion dollars out of this that sort of stuff uh, there's a whole spectrum of people who invest uh, including people who are looking for more <coughs> modest returns or or, or even social or for purpose returns. It's not quite philanthropy, nothing wrong with philanthropy either, uh, who will invest in slightly less ambitious commercially ideas. And I'm just thinking, you know, literally uh, um, I connected a, a local entrepreneur to, uh, to an investor about something that's a bit commercial, but it's much more for purpose. Um, and um, $500,000 investment was made. Uh, it does happen. Right, but on but but you're going to get no more than yes. Um, Ken, I know you've heard no yeah. a lot. Andy, I know you've heard no yeah. a lot. Any 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 advice about how to deal with no? Yeah, just before we move on, just uh, just sure. made me think about like a really good example of uh, yep. some innovative uh, you know crowdfunding. A um, uh, of all things, it's I, I won't be able to remember the name, but it's a, a great guy down on the south coast somewhere that started a mobile abattoir that. Um, does uh, you know you you pre buy your organic beef, uh, so you know sort of you know, so don't be afraid to think about outside of the box. You know this guy's done chickens, he's now doing meat, and already thinking about the next one. Um, the no, is, I think, just you know it's uh, I don't know. It's never easy. It's never pleasant. You know you you feel like you're selling your soul. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, for me, the first business I grew was completely organic, you know, leveraging the equity I had in my house and then, you know, borrowing. And uh, it was a, a long journey, 15, 16, 17 years before selling that business. And, you know, it was really, I was so naive when I look back, you know, what, I, what was achieved in 15 years, if I had gone and sought investment capital, we probably could have done it in seven or eight years. And so lesson learned. The second one, used some of my money, but a lot of other people's money. That was a three or four year journey. So much quicker growth, the point of, of selling the business. And the third one was um, where, you know, a lot of, you know, where I inherited a, uh, I took, a, I guess, really a science project, almost or a, a, an experiment, I should say. And um, we raised a lot of capital. The company was already publicly listed. It was you know, sort of a turnaround event. And um, the company was completely held by uh, private uh, PIs, private in investors on the UK stock exchange. And we gradually converted that to about 60% institutionally on that. So for, you know, probably three or four times a year, you're you know, really selling your soul to large investment companies. And, you know, the only thing I could do when I first got there was tell them that, you know, the only thing I could promise was that I'd never lie to them because everything else was at risk. And, uh, it took a long time. It was an eight or nine year journey to, to transition that business. But the, I think when it's not really, the no isn't important. What's important is the why they're saying no. 
and going back and really thinking about, you know, they might just be the wrong person you're talking to, but in most cases, a seasoned investor will have some really good reasons to not invest. That's either poor alignment with their fund and their expectations or something you're doing wrong or your own expectations are unrealistic. I mean, we often see it. I mean, and especially, you know, we all, you know, read about the, you know, what's going on in North America on the West coast and have these ideas of valuation. And there's so many companies that, you know, that will, you know, that all advise and you know, they want to go to London, they want to go to California and then, okay, just, yeah, I was just going to say that they're so off mark with the valuations that they'll receive here in Australia. And I think that you have to, really you know, do some soul searching before you go out looking for money. Otherwise it can be a, a pretty demoralizing process. I, I love, uh, Ken, I love to, to try and think why I got to know, and you may not even agree with that person's reasoning, but yeah. you can learn from it. And what, and, and then the key question is not, does that feel bad? But the key question from my point of view is what am I going to do about it? Where else am I going to look? How am I going to look different? Does that make sense? Uh, Roseanne, did you, you look like you wanted to comment on that? Oh, I must no? always look like I don't want to comment. Uh, so so uh, just kind of to, to add to, to Ken's point there, mm -hmm. it's really important to spend the time listening to the feedback that you're getting, uh, asking the why, um, digging a bit deeper, because sometimes it's, it's not no forever. It could be yeah. no not right yet. now and yep. or no but. So think think about your your approach and getting in the right frame of mind to receive the feedback and dig a bit deeper Fantastic. yeah I, I, I think just quickly uh, okay. sorry i don't want to hog your, at people's time but i think that's good often you know like it's hard to really from the outside you know when you look at uh vc whether it's australian or american when you look at them it's like you know they're money for everybody but once you get in the door you'll find out very quickly you know certain ones are looking for early stage, low valuation, rapid growth. Other ones are looking for companies similar to the ones they've invested before. Other ones are looking for companies in specific space and they don't really understand your space yet. Um, so it's really, you know, the, there's, you know, even in Australia, I mean, they're, they're, you, know, you, you could quickly find a list of 20 venture capital firms, but you probably only five are the ones you should be talking to. Uh, I can give you a list of 100 venture capital firms. Everyone just Google ESVCLP. They're the registered early stage venture capital limited funds. They have to register to get certain tax offsets and, it, and, it's, and it's on the government website. And there's a list of all the funds that are registered. Um, and you can also Google, there's an there's a angel investor list um, put together by venture fund Airtree that lists hundreds of local angel investors. There's lots of, and LinkedIn is your friend there too. So there's lots of ways of finding investors and you're trying to think what's the, where are the ones where I can fit? Um, Andy, what's your experience been? Just to go back to the impact space and social yep. enterprises, I, I think that really is a growing space. So um, well worth a look. There's a great network down in Melbourne called the Impact Angel Network or, words in some order along those lines um so they, you know and there are other networks as well so that's uh, it's well worth exploring um i think in terms of no you know it's never easy as ken said and um learning from it can be can take a lot of humility and, and bravery um i think part of it for me is making sure you've got good people around you who can um lean on whose advice you trust uh the other thing that comes to mind is being really clear on the vision of what you're trying to do. So if you're getting feedback, particularly when you're starting out and you don't have a lot of experience in the space, um, it, it's hard to separate out what, uh, you know, suggestions from investors and whether that's taking you on the right path or, or any, uh, any other advisors. So I think just separating out whether it's something that uh, a learning that can still get you to that vision just a slightly different way or whether it's something that's taking you off course. Yeah, look, that's a really, really important point, Andy. Um, I encourage people to listen to feedback, but that doesn't mean you do what was suggested. I want you to listen and then you've got to make your own decisions. You've got to find your own way. Um, listen, collect information. But you, when you're getting feedback, you should be collecting, um, you should be, uh, collecting information. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I've got two more I've got two particular things I want to ask the panel about, and I'm just about to do that. But while I'm doing that, I want you, all the audience, put more questions on the chat and we'll get the panel engaged with that. Uh, look, so first I'm going to just quickly throw to Rose 
Roseanne, um, we haven't really mentioned much about the research and development tax incentive. Um, I think it's a very key mechanism for many uh, innovative businesses. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about that? So uh, I'm probably not the best person from PwC to do that. My colleague Damien Hollingsworth absolutely oh. is though, oh. and he is um, connected into Craig and I can share his contact details here mm -hmm. um, and uh, make sure that you're connected into the information you need to know about it. But what I will say is it is such a wonderful mechanism from the government that can help you to really get up off the ground. But it also puts in place, a, you know, some, some things to get you thinking a bit more critically about what it is you're doing and the outcomes you're hoping to achieve. So when you are using these sorts of government mechanisms, the kind of questions that they're asking and the forms you have to fill in might feel a little bit frustrating, but what it does is it really hones your thinking um, to get crisp on what it is you want to achieve, the value that you're giving. Yeah, fantastic. And I'll just, uh, just, and that, get advice is always a good piece of advice. Yeah. Um, and the research and development tax incentive, if, if you're doing qualifying research and development, you have to go through a little bit of process with the Department of Industry. You're doing real research and development that satisfies their criteria, and lots of you probably are. Um, you get 42, 42 cents in the dollar of cash you spend on that project, including payments to staff, as cash back in your tax return. It's a lot of money. It can be a, a big chunk. Get 40, and that's not a tax deduction. That's literally cash in your tax return. Uh, so be aware of that. It's a really important one. Um, I'm just, uh, Ken, tell us a little bit more about Epicorp and, and as, or what you can offer to entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's pretty unique. I think, you know, the, um, so this money was, as Craig said, was leftovers or proceeds coming back from the disposal disposal of companies, fairly significant companies that the, uh, you know, that where investments were made over 20 years ago. And as these companies grew and, and, you know, or went through transactions and uh, liquidity events or IPOs, et cetera, the, the money came back into, uh, into Epicor's bank account. So it's a not-for-profit, and all we're trying to do is help organizations grow more quickly and to give them the right type of money at the right time. So there's a, a time, a point in time where depending on where your life, your business is in that life cycle, early stage, you know, pre-revenue even, uh, or on the edge of revenue, you, you've, you know, the perfect example, you've done an icon grant, you've built a minimum viable product, you've got a customer, you're going to market, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And if you just had a little bit more money to accelerate things, you know, buy a little bit more production capability, hire a few more people, you know, get a bigger whatever, um, uh, we can help you with that. So that's at the, the bottom end. It's uh, you know, loans, non-secured non loans. So I'm not looking for any security from you personally or over IP. We're not looking for equity uh, or warrants, et cetera. We're really just lending you the money at our risk. Uh, and all we're looking for is the ability for you to pay us back over 24 months. And the reason it's 24 months is we want to recycle that money over and over to help as many companies as possible. We can be extremely flexible on the, the repayment model, whether it's you know interest only, no repayments for a period, lump sum. Um, you know, and then we move away from this early stage to like, you know, middle stage where an organization has an opportunity to capitalize on something and if they could buy more inventory or if they could buy another machine, uh, you know, sort of a scale up, uh, again, we can step in and, and lend you the money. And at the other end, if you're a more mature company and you're having you know, the sort of regular cash crunch while you're waiting for your R&D grant to come back in or you're waiting for a contract or you're waiting for something that's gonna make a difference to your bank account, we can give you some bridging finance. And uh, the company, I think we, we just crossed the threshold a couple of weeks ago. We've done 15 loans, totaling over $2 million now. Uh, we've been at it for a year. It was supposed to be, it was a one-year trial, which finished in, uh, what it should have finished about now, but uh, we went to the board in October and I think we exceeded everybody's expectation and the demand surprised the board. And they've given us, allowed us to put the rest of the money in, to, into play. So that money's there. There's um, you know, literally a, a, a 30 second form to fill out on our website, epicorp.biz.biz. Uh, and the, um, 
you know, that sort of is seen as an expression of interest. We then have a you know 20 minute chat with you about what you're trying to do and why and when and with who. And uh, if you sell us on the idea, then there's a sort of a 20 minute form to fill out. Then we go away and do a bunch of due diligence. And then we go to an independent investment panel where we try to bring in some subject matter expertise that matches your business. And uh, you get an answer on the day. And we've done that. It's been as quick as if somebody's in a hurry and really struggling for some money to do something. We've done it as quickly as two weeks. Um, it's usually about probably a four to six week process for us. Uh, if there's no pressure on us, we only do this one day a week. And the sorts of organizations that we've supported, you know, we go all the way from bakeries and, and beverage to electric guitars into deep tech. So we, we're agnostic about you know, what it is you do. And we're trying to service this sort of corridor, business corridor, you know, we call it the ACT business corridor. So anywhere between you know, the sort of, I get my, my directions wrong, I still think I'm in the Northern hemisphere, but you know, the Melbourne to Sydney, kind of north, going Northeast from Melbourne to Sydney and anything in between along the coast and inland to Wagga, sort of across the snowy range. Uh, fantastic, thanks, uh, Ken. Um, Irene put a link to your website on the chat. Thank go you. And have, everyone go and have a look. That's not the right product for everyone every time, but you really want to look at options like that. And in the venture yeah. debt space, you're not going to find a friendlier lender. Yeah, I guess I, the two things I didn't say, yeah. sorry, just quickly, Craig. Okay. One is that the, um, I've already forgot one of them. Maybe it'll come back to me. But um, you know, the other thing that comes with it is as much free business consulting as you want from myself and James Palmer on Fridays at, sitting in front of Craig's office at Seabrin. And the other one is that, um, I don't know, I can't remember. Well, we'll jump in when you do, um, but I've got some really good questions on the chat, but while we're talking about that sort of funding, Andy, just tell us a little bit more about the accelerating commercialization grants, because for people who are really facing big technology or product barriers, you know, need some substantial investment, that's been a big support over the years. Yeah, I mean, Ken talked about, you, you talked about um, different products are not the right ones for everyone, and AC certainly has a particular fit, I think, for a lot of people. Um, the ICON grants uh, are a great starting point if you're sort of at that slightly earlier stage. But yeah, for companies who've developed some great technology uh, are at the prototype stage, but have still a significant pathway to be able to get to the market. So it might be 12 months worth of trials and piloting and um, scaling up manufacturing. If it's a hardware product, then that's the sort of gap that, that we sit in. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to take up too much time. It's probably enough. Well, look, and I think really the answer there is uh, if you think that sort of funding might be relevant to your particular project, what should you do? Should go and have a chat to Andy, right? And yeah, Andy will put his contact details in the chat or Irene can do that for you. Uh, I'm just going to bring out a couple of questions from the chat. And um, uh, Julian's asked, how do you assess if an angel investor is potentially interested in smaller to medium business investing, don't want to waste anyone's time? Uh, my personal advice, Julian, is just ask them. I'm thinking, of, I'm, I'm in, give them a quick summary. I'm doing this sort of thing. Would you like to know more? That's the way I do it. Anyone else want to add to that? Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid. You're up front, time efficiently, give, give people a little bit of exposure and ask them, would you like to know more? And I, 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 yep. I have the privilege of having a, you know, a couple of just incredible mentors, you know, who uh, are, are now gone and uh, I miss them dearly. But, you know, one of them was, uh, you know, his mantra was always that you know, nothing starts without a conversation and uh, don't be afraid to have it. And um, it's, it's worked for me uh, a lot. Yeah. So really, and thanks for saying that, Ken, don't be afraid to have a chat to somebody, reach out, Offer them a chat. Keep it nice and short and time efficient. If you're not sure, you know, they might be a busy person. Make it easy for them. Make it easy for them to say yes. And and and, and probably my other um, little tip on that sort of thing, to make it less stressful for you and for them, make it easy for them to say no, right? You don't have to be pushy in this space. Just say, I'm doing these things. Is it of interest to you? And if they say, well, not really, don't keep trying to convince them. Say thanks for your time and go find somebody who is interested. That'll make your life happier and their life happier. Does, does that sort of make sense? Anyone else want to add in on that? I think in terms of approaching angels or investors or anyone, just remember that there's no rule book and everyone's making it up as they go along. Yep. As, as much as you can draw on others' experience, there's no right or wrong way. 
Uh, it goes through your network. Sometimes your customers turn out to be investors. There are formal angel investing groups, Innovation Bay, Sydney Angels, Capital Angels is a, is a local angel investing group here in Canberra. Uh, reach out, see what you find, ask, as Ken said, have a conversation, have a conversation. Um, Holly's asked when you're starting out with a commercial uh, manufacturing of a product, how do you know if someone's giving you, a, oh, if they're giving you a fair price on supplying it to them, um, well, and how can you ask them to help you out with the cost? Well, firstly, reference check them. Uh, use your networks, talk to people in the industry, maybe get multiple quotes. It's all time, but it's what Ken said, it's conversations. It's conversations. Yeah, I, I just say, you know, like, I mean, the ACT, the landscape here has changed a lot over the last 10 years. You know, if you look at the companies now that are, you know, whether it's seeing machines, you know, with their products, liquid instruments with theirs, uh, you know, all the way down to much, much lower volume or into really precision medical stuff. There's a lot of people doing that here in the ACT who are engaged with manufacturers and you want to find the right one. There's a, you know, a great uh, Singaporean family that's heavily involved here through uh, in Uconnect Ventures and through um, uh, where I work sometimes at uh, um, CSD instruments. Great Liquid instruments, yeah. Yeah, so the, you know, just at the, there's a lot of people doing that. And um, again, talk to the people that are buying from mm -hmm. them. You, you want to find the right manufacturer. You know, if you're, you don't want to be too small and you don't want to be too big. You've got to you know, dovetail in in the right place. And there's some great Australian companies that can do low, you know, low volume, but will help you transition to higher volume offshore at the right time. It's just finding them. And uh, it's, a, it's a daunting road. And um, yeah, I wish I could say I've never gotten it wrong. Uh, <laughs> and you're getting it wrong and having 30,000 of something that don't work is a really bad place to be with a company that doesn't care about it and the service. Uh, I might just yeah. add to that, Ken, no. um, being being across their supply chain, uh, because clearly with, with manufacturers, their, their supply is going to be critical to your supply. So, so understanding who are their suppliers, uh, do you see integrity in, in that chain? Uh, and I guess the other t thing too is don't be afraid to go and see it for yourself. So is that's there a factory that's, that's producing nice. it? Um, yeah. you know, be uh, active in understanding those who will supply you. Yeah. So uh, come and see them. I think extending that, that's a really valid point. And I, I think, you know, don't put aside, like don't underestimate the uh, complexity of uh, cultural differences as well. Yeah, it's hard work to build those relationships. It doesn't always happen quickly. And, 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 and I think the tenor of your question a little bit was, well, I feel like I'm a bit naive in this space. I don't know. Well, we were all naive when we started out and the, the trick is to, is to learn as quickly as you can and get the best advice that you can. Um, uh, I think just one, one more on that, yeah. just to close that, you know, that it's uh, the COVID and post COVID world are very, very different from a manufacturing right. perspective. You know, the big, big companies have done so much risk buying now that smaller companies are having to buy on the gray market and buying end of run, you know, end of life runs of, of FPGAs and uh, all sorts of things. And sometimes it's literally a 10 cent part that is gonna prevent you from bringing your product to market on time. A lot of the companies I'm working with are having to you know, scramble to redesign things to use different stuff because the stuff they'd like to use is a, gone from like a, you know, available right now to a, uh, I think in one case, it's a 47 week wait right now. Wow, ouch. Out. I'm just going to quickly search for a couple of questions while I'm doing that for our panel members. I'd like you to think of a last thought to leave everyone because we are sort of crunching up against towards the, the end of our hour. Uh, very quickly, uh, somebody asked, does Epicorp support service-based businesses? Ken, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, you know, probably half of them are, you know, I mean, service-based business, yes. Great. Easy. Like, work, anything out. almost. Yeah. yeah, look, so a lot of us are not really just sort of fixated on software as a service as the only thing we want to back. I think that's a misrepresentation of the innovation community that's that's sometimes a bit thought out there. There's a lots of different, there's a lot of openness to that. Uh, Tristan asks, are there, can, can we fund salespeople? Can we fund a more broad, I'll broaden it out. Can we fund our team as we're building up uh, start, uh, towards sales? 
yes, yes, yes. And that's often what uh, venture debt, venture capital um, and, and grants uh, are used to fund. You, you build your team a little bit in advance of your revenue and try and bring it all together. Panel, anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's all, I guess, you know, the, the, the success of your business is, is dependent on a whole bunch of things and you know, whatever you need, when you need it is what you want the money for. So, you know, yeah. you, you've got a strategy, a growth strategy, a plan, a technology roadmap, and, you know, the, the money serves all of those prongs. Has to. You know, and uh, go on, Roseanne. I was just going to say sometimes money doesn't need to be in the shape of money. Uh, it could be in the shape of services that you might receive from an investor or uh, you know, support that you might need to crack into different markets. So, so I don't think of money as needing to be cash. It could be yeah. in kind. I'd even go further. That's a great point. Sometimes it's, it's, it's actually services that money could never buy you. You know, good, two examples at Seam Machines, being able to have Caterpillar, you know, ruggedize and test your equipment in their, their test site or going to someone like FedEx and them doing you know, longitudinal studies in their simulators running, you know, 20 or 30 pilots through the simulator for five or six hours till they fall asleep. Those are things that it, it wouldn't matter how much money you had, you could not buy. Um, and yet, you know, you can find a partner that will do that for you at no cost in exchange for access to your product later on. Um, so yeah, couldn't agree more with all of that. A super quick one from Claire, and I think I've got a really simple answer to that. Can different shareholders have a different price for the same number of shares in the same round? And I, my answer would be to same terms is good etiquette in investor world. And, and going against that will typically cause big problems. Not always, there's a time and a place to break the rules, but I would tend to think that same terms for investors in the same round is generally a good mechanism. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be the person to explain to the person that paid more why they paid more. Indeed, indeed. Um, any last thoughts, Roseanne? Uh, we need innovators. We need you to bring your ideas. So I wish you best of luck. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, I think um, I remembered what I was going to say earlier, and I used that as my, my closing. Basically, you know, there's, there's a time to not give away equity, and there's a time to give away equity. And when it is time to give away or sell equity, you want to be at some doing it at, at for the right reasons at the right price. Yeah, I mean, one really tangible one that hasn't come up today is safe notes. I think might be a good option for people to consider if it's something they're not across. Um, and a more a more general point is just to keep focusing on the customers. Um, if you're if you're getting those for investors, go back to your customers, keep um, building them out, adding more value to them. It's it's certainly the number one thing we look at. I know Sebron um, yep. practically has it tattooed yep. on all of their staff members. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, uh, and if I just I add to that, you know, if, if the answer is always no, then you probably want to go back and look at what you're trying to do and how yeah. you're doing it. Yeah. So yeah, listen to feedback. Um, customers, customers, customers. I'm super big on customers. Just before we run out of time, I really want to just, just mention a couple of the resources that we've mentioned. Innovation Connect grants, which we really didn't dwell on. The Innovation Network here, we administer some grant money from the ACT government. These are up to $30,000 grants for early stage prototype uh, businesses. Um, get on our website, find out more, book an intro meeting so you can find out more. Book an intro meeting on the Canberra Innovation Network website. I think Irene's posted a link. We run a, a, a workshop program called ID to Impact. It's the 10 week customer challenge. We spend 10 weeks showing you how to engage with customers. We're gonna give you a bunch of tools. That's coming up in, um, in, in late April. Uh, Epicorp we've mentioned, uh, we're, doing, we're doing an idea thon. Who wants, to spend, who wants to spend a couple of hours coming up with ideas? Get on our website, see the link that Irene's posting, ideas. So we've got some really fun activities here as well coming up. Uh, the next webinar we're doing is called Shaping the Deal, and we're going to hear from a really senior lawyer about a lot of the deals that, that he has shaped and been a part of. And even if you're not ready to do deals like that, you're going to find it really interesting to learn about what's the factor. Roseanne mentioned earlier, you know, well, you've got to try and keep your structures right in the beginning. Well, think about the end and it can help you with that. Um, Andy, I hope we've put a link to the Accelerating Commercialization Grant information to find out more. Um, connect to mentors and advisors. Connect to mentors and advisors. Get, connect to each other. Talk about these things. 
share information. The, it, it, I can't overemphasize enough that sharing this sort of information will lead to better outcomes, connect you together. Um, so that's my quick plug at the end for those um, key activities. Um, come along to our webinars and we'll do more. And we've got some really interesting people. Oh, by the way, I've got a billion dollar panel coming up with this guy called Mike Gregg. Uh, his story is unbelievable. And you're gonna really hear the long story of a person, a really entrepreneurial person and all the things that they've been involved in. We've got so much good things coming up. Any last questions? Um, uh, come and engage, come and talk to us. It's super easy for every entrepreneur to book an intro meeting to come in and have a chat to the Innovation Network team. And we'll always try and connect you to some resources or help you to be more self-empowered uh, or potentially you might apply for the Innovation Connect grant, which is one of the things we do, or the Idea to Impact program. Um, anything else I should cover, Irene, panel members? I'm just scrolling through the chat to see if I can see anything I need to respond to, but I think we're really good. We've gone one minute over time. Sorry about that, everybody. We tried to cram this in. You can see there's so much more we could have talked about. It's, it's a really complicated space, lots more, but I hope we've given you some tips that would allow you to, to do your own research and dig into these particular things. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you extremely much for our really great talent, talented panel of experts, uh, Roseanne Brand from PwC, Ken Kroger from Epicorp, Andy Barley from Accelerating Commercialization. Thank you so much. Um, if that's it, I think we'll wrap up. Anyone else want to say anything? Thanks, Craig. Thank you so much for having it, so Thank for you. being part of a panel and Thank guests. You. And it's only good with guests, lots of questions. And I'll be seeing you all in person, I hope, pretty soon. Cheers, everyone. Bye.